Good afternoon. Welcome to our conference this afternoon on uh, the title Sustainable Batteries and LA for the Green Recovery. My name is Michael Lippert. I'm uh, the moderator of this session. I am the chairman of the European Technology uh, and Innovation Platform Batteries Europe. Uh, I'm also one of the chairmen of uh, the European Association for Storage of, of Energy. And, and other than this, I'm working for SAFT, who is a French manufacturer of, uh, of batteries. <laughs> the need for urgent and more intensive actions against climate change is broadly recognized and has gained enormous moment over the past months in Europe, in particular through the Green Deal and Europe's, Europe's recovery plan. In the same time, we acknowledge that uh, there's an important role of batteries. Batteries can be a systemic enabler for a major shift to bring transportation and power to greenhouse gas neutrality. Yet the European battery industry is lagging behind, mainly uh, behind Asian competition, both in terms of leadership in advanced technologies and industry capacity. So today we want to get a better understanding about the Green Deal and Recovery Plan on the one hand, and what it means for the energy sector in general and batteries in particular. Who does what? What does the Green Deal for batteries and what can batteries do to achieve green recovery goals? In order to do this, we have uh, put together uh, a good panel. Uh, we have representatives from the European Commission, uh, types series from uh, the DG Ener, uh, we have uh, Mattia Pellegrini from DG Environment and James Copping from DG Grow. And we have representatives from industry and research. I welcome uh, Christina Edström from Uppsala University and Emma Nierenheim from Northwold, as well as Diego Pavia from Kik Energy. And we also have you, the audience, and of course we want uh, to uh, have this quite uh, uh, quite uh, interactive. Uh, so throughout all this session, you will be able to ask uh, questions and to participate in our poll. But before we come to this, uh, I uh, ask our speakers to introduce themselves uh, quickly. Uh, so uh, I go uh, along the lines of this uh, slide. Uh, Mr. Siemens, would you briefly introduce yourself? Yes, hello. I'm uh, Hatsu Zimas. I am uh, the head of unit uh, of DG NRC2, which is the unit in charge of innovation, clean energy technologies and competitiveness. And our job is basically to make sure that we put, put the closest link possible between what is happening in terms of research and innovation activities uh, in the energy context in the European Union and the objectives that we're trying to achieve in terms of decarbonization and uh, the Green Deal. Thank you, Mr. Siemers. Uh, Mr. Pellegrini? I'm afraid you are muted. Would you unmute yourself? Sorry. Good afternoon, everybody. My name is Mattia Pellegrini. I'm the head of unit for waste management and secondary raw materials, which is one of the two units which is responsible for the new batteries uh, regulation. So um, we are in charge of the current batteries directive and we are preparing by October of this year the new batteries uh, regulation. Thank you very much. Mr. Pavia? Yes, good afternoon everybody. My name is Diego Pavia. I'm the CEO of Inno Energy. And what we do is that we identify innovators and we invest and support them so they make their dreams become true. Since 2010, we have invested in around 450 innovations. And today we are sitting at around 40 assets in storage. Thank you. Mrs. Nierenheim from Northwold. So good afternoon, everyone. I'm Emma Nierenheim. I work as a chief environmental officer at Northwold since three years. Uh, we have the mission to build the world's greenest battery and my role in the company is to make sure that we are sustainable in the supply chain, in the production, in the batteries we put on the market, that we have a good 
performance of those and that we make sure we return the battery materials to new batteries in recycling at the end of life. Thank you, uh, Emma. Christina Edström from uh, Uppsala. Thank you so much. Good afternoon. I am Christina Edström, Professor of Inorganic Chemistry at Uppsala University in Sweden, but I'm also the coordinator of Battery 2030 Plus, where we are trying to complement the set plan on batteries with uh, visionary research ideas that uh, are long term, but we also hope that they can help industry in Europe to really grow uh, with visionary research as a support. Thank you for this. And our uh, last speaker is then James Copping. Please introduce yourself. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. Yes, I'm James Copping, working in DG Grow, which is the industrial policy part of the uh, European Commission. I'm working in the automotive unit and, amongst other things, uh, working in the European Battery Alliance, which is the Commission's initiative to establish a, uh, a, a competitive but sustainable battery value chain in Europe. Thank you. Thank you very much to all the six of you. I'm looking forward to uh, your presentations and discussions. Now, what we have prepared for this afternoon is a conference in three major blocks. Uh, we will have a first block where we look about, uh, we, have, we have more uh, a helicopter view and uh, talk about batteries in the European energy system in general and of course, in the context of the EU recovery plan. Uh, we will then have a, a second block where we talk about uh, system in sustainability. Uh, so we'll get some insights on the upcoming regulation for batteries and uh, in particular, the point of view then of an industrial player in this area. And uh, we'll have a third block where we look on a more longer term view on research and innovation. And in particular, the skills and education we need in Europe to make this happen. So uh, we will uh, have uh, short presentations of our speakers uh, per block and then uh, open the floor to uh, some questions. And therefore, now it's up to you, to the, to the audience. Uh, we will, you can, as I said, you can uh, ask questions uh, throughout the, the session and we will try then to, to answer to this during our Q&A session. And you will also uh, be able to participate to our polls. But you'll have, uh, we have prepared a number of questions which I would like uh, you to, to answer to. And I would now like to show you, to test this and to, to show the first poll uh, with a number of questions. There we are. What do you think? Uh, do sustainable batteries exist today? And uh, please, on the right-hand side of your screen, you can directly answer uh, yes or no, or you don't know. So it seems to work out very nicely. And we see uh, that the audience is responding. Well, it is, uh, most of you still uh, uh, think that uh, the answer is is no. Well, I hope it, uh, this, this debate uh, makes it a little bit clearer and we'll discuss about what do we mean, do we, do, what do we understand by sustainable batteries and do we have a path to come to sustainable batteries. I would also like to uh, start with our first, what we call the word cloud immediately. And uh, so it's a, can we open the, the word cloud number one, please? Uh, here you have the chance to enter please one or two words. And the question is, which application, for which application batteries can support the green recovery? We wait a little bit to see 
to see the, the, the results. But without a major surprise, obviously, uh, there are a, a lot of you believing that it is around mobility, and we see mobility, cars, uh, e-mobility, automotive, they are pretty much synonymous. Uh, but storage is, uh, is, is, is a center uh, uh, motivation here. And uh, I think it is quite consensually clear that the two main leverage effects we can achieve is on the power side and on the mobility side. So we leave this uh, still open a, a little bit. But other than this, I would like to get into our first block. Uh, we will have uh, Heitze Seamers as first speaker and then uh, uh, Diego Pavia. And I would like the first, uh, the introductory slide for this, please. Thank you. As I mentioned, and pretty much in line with uh, your suggestions, dear, dear audience, uh, batteries do have a major role to play in both the power sector and in the transportation sector. They enable to green these uh, two industries, and, and we have seen just a number of, of pictures here. Uh, of course, on the power sector, we are talking about uh, existing roles and application segments of batteries, uh, for example, in electricity infrastructure, in telecom infrastructure, uh, but uh, in pre oh, but also in the in the industry. On the transportation side, uh, clearly, uh, in order to get to e-mobility, we need electric vehicles. But more than that, globally, transportation based on electricity, so public transportation, whether it's on road, on rail in the air or on ships, but we also have an industrial segment where today uh, we need to transport goods, not that much people, like uh, forklifts and uh, a number of other industrial applications, and batteries have a role to play in all of them. Now, uh, at the Davos Forum earlier this, uh, earlier this year, a report presented by the Global Battery Alliance stated that batteries could enable up to 30% of the required reductions in carbon emissions in the transport and power sectors. If you could show the next slide, please. Yeah, uh, in 2017, these two uh, sectors, transport and power, contributed to roughly 40% of the global greenhouse gas emissions uh, in uh, which we figure at, at about 50 gigatons in 2017. So the indirect potential of reducing green, greenhouse gas reductions is quite uh, quite important. With this having in mind, I'll uh, now pass the, the floor to Heitze Simmers from uh, DG Energy. Uh, and he's the first speaker, not only because uh, he needs to leave a little bit later. So if you have questions specifically to him, uh, do uh, enter them right now. Uh, but, but also because uh, I want to, to express my special thanks to DG Energy for the support they have provided and they continue to provide, provide of course, to the battery community, and in particular to setting up the ETIP Batteries Europe and supporting our operation. So special thanks to Mr. Siemens, and the floor is yours, please. Okay, thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Michael, and uh, I'm, I'm really pleased to be here. I really want to thank uh, Batteries Europe for organizing this session, uh, as, you, as you did, in cooperation with Batteries 2030. And um, it is an important topic uh, to discuss how sustainable batteries can help with the green recovery. Before we, we go into kind of the specifics of the subject, I think uh, we have to somehow pay homage to the overall context as well. Uh, you know, for me, uh, um, this has been a, a very interesting ride the last few months, a completely uncharted territory um, with, uh, as you can imagine, all of us having uh, increasing uh, difficulties simply to plan and foresee how exactly we're going to be going about the next few months 
Just to give you a little anecdote on this, my team is also in charge of the overall organization of European Sustainable Energy Week. And um, it was uh, quite interesting uh, to see the evolution from a presential event, which is what it was planned to be for this week, to a digital event and turning uh, you know, all the technological things that we have available to our advantage in terms of trying to organize this. And uh, obviously, we, uh, we are waiting with bated breath to see to what extent this is uh, something that, uh, that works or doesn't work and uh, to what if, uh, extent it's satisfactory or not satisfactory. Um, anyway, I mean, the, all of this, I think, is, is something that is quite, uh, quite interesting. Never mind then, you know, since I am on the subject of digital technologies, the importance of digital for all of the things that we want to do in terms of uh, the future of our economies and the future of our energy system, not least of which is, is batteries as well. Um, at the same time, I think what, what is also important to keep in mind is that we do have massive opportunities uh, coming out of this, um, uh, this situation. Um, and that the fact that we have uh, some form of a crisis already going on, which is climate change, combined now with an acute economic crisis, in a way is not something that should discourage us, but is something that, that adds to the potential that we have to turn this to our advantage and to deal with the climate and to deal with emissions uh, at the same time as actually creating growth and competitiveness. Um, it may sound a little bit, um, how shall I say, naive, but I do think that uh, there is a little bit of an El Dorado at the end of this story here, which is that the, the, because we've had these economic challenges, we also have massive opportunities in terms of turning things into a direction that maybe a year ago we wouldn't have thought about or not have thought about in the same way. So I think that that's quite, uh, quite important. The next thing I think that uh, then is important also is that from the European Commission side, and I, we have a couple of uh, colleagues here, plus Diego, who knows this stuff quite well as well, we have tried to put everything that we can into um, our move towards uh, 2021 and beyond the next multi-annual financial framework, but also the short term in terms of trying to support the economic recovery and doing this around the Green Deal that we had uh, proposed before. Uh, you will all have seen the announcements around Next Generation EU about the recovery and resilience facility, the renovation wave specifically in terms of, uh, of energy, everything that we're looking at in terms of offshore energy, um, the recovery and resilience plans that we're trying to work at with the member states in the context of what we already do on the governance of the energy union, and so forth and so on. Um, so all of this, I think, really the message is it's time to move forward, not backwards, and to use every opportunity to create the, the win-wins that are really available there. This is not just a cliche, but it's really there. Now, on batteries, of course, I think that's a technology which um, looks like it's weathering quite well, and that's where the opportunities are already very close. Um, the the uh, word cloud now showed it. But also everything that's related to um, the development of the mobility market has shown, will show this and is showing this as well, which is that batteries are really something that we, uh, we need to be continuing to work at. The most important thing there for us is that we continue on this straight line through the various initiatives that had already been taken over the, very, uh, over the previous years, which is to build a solid value chain for batteries technologies in Europe, obviously in a context that uh, puts an emphasis on sustainability. And here, I think Batteries Europe is an important uh, component. And yes, indeed, uh, Michael, we are quite proud at DG Energy that we've, uh, we've been a motor in uh, getting the ETIP, uh, European Technology and Innovation Platform, off the ground, simply because uh, we think that it is the right instrument to make sure that we pull together everything that we do on research and innovation and that we coordinate this as uh, well as possible in the context of um, batteries and in the context of what we already had in the form of the battery uh, alliance. Um, of course, all of this would not be possible without a strong facilitation by organizations like InnoEnergy, Diego, uh, and uh, also others like uh, the European Energy Research uh, Alliance and EASE and the strong governing structures we've created. So all of that, I think, is, uh, is really, uh, it's, it's working out well so far. We have the structures in place. I think now is the moment to make sure that, that it delivers as effectively as possible. Important for us, of course, is uh, all the things that you've heard about in the context of the Green Deal and the recovery package, carbon neutrality by 2050, um, emission cuts that will be more steep uh, rather than less steep um, by 2030 and beyond. Um, the um, 
the fact that we are uh, looking at uh, announcing an energy systems integration communication uh, over the next couple of weeks. Um, and, you know, the fact that uh, electrification and in particular electrification of mobility is going to be an enormous part of that story. Um, E-mobility as well as stationary storage will be driving the batteries market. Um, and we, um, I think, uh, will get uh, to uh, stationary batteries, for example, that will have a role that is similar to what we have by, uh, in terms of pumped hydro storage already uh, around 2030. Um, the important thing, of course, is that uh, we need to facilitate everything that comes around it, including the rollout of public charging infrastructure. Um, One million charging stations is the plan by 2025, and uh, we are working on everything that's uh, uh, surrounding that, whether it's 10T or uh, the AFIT directive, um, and of course, uh, all the financial support instruments that we've, uh, we've kicked up on this. Um, we have to work on the impact of e-mobility on the grid, doing this through, for example, network codes, um, and ensuring that we can strengthen demand-side flexibility uh, and allow that uh, the uptake of um, electric vehicles will actually contribute to the flexibility of the energy system rather than being a burden on it. Um, stationary storage will benefit from these measures as well because uh, both uh, the renovation wave and what we propose, we will be proposing on offshore renewable energy integration of renewables in the grid will require uh, stronger storage, which includes obviously uh, batteries. And then, uh, indeed, uh, we have to continue working with national governments um, to make sure that uh, all of this moves in a direction where it's not just something that we propose at the European level, but where all the national measures for decarbonization are as coherent as possible with what we're doing at the European level. Um, what was already done under uh, the national uh, energy and climate plans, and uh, as you know, these are being assessed for the moment, uh, is an important component of that. But the national recovery plans that we're discussing right now is something that is a really important part of that avail, uh, as well. All right. Um, we will have funds on the Horizon Europe, obviously, uh, for this, uh, for notably uh, the, the, the partnership on batteries. Uh, but it's not just Horizon Europe. Um, all of the funding instruments that are available are going to be really important to contribute to, uh, to this exercise. Um, we're looking at uh, the launch uh, webinar of the Batteries Partnership this Friday. Um, and we expect that a lot of the, the members of Batteries Europe will join it and submit impressive pledges for uh, advancing this, um, uh, this initiative. Um, so again, I think we're all on the right track for batteries now, but as it is for everything that we do in terms of the energy systems and we, we do in terms of decarbonization and in terms of making sure that we have a low emission, zero emission uh, energy system in Europe by 2050, um, the proof of the pudding is in the eating. And the most important thing is that we move ahead as quickly as possible with uh, deployment um, we'll hear a lot about what the actual technologies themselves do from uh, colleagues uh, around the table now, including from, from Northwold, I guess. Um, so, voila, the, the message is there. We have everything in place. Let's make sure that it happens. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Haidt. Indeed, I, uh, I, I'm, I agree with you that, that speed is, is a major factor here and uh, uh, and. And I think it is well understood by now that uh, uh, we need to go uh, fast here because uh, uh, we do have international competition. With this, I uh, pass the floor to uh, Diego. Uh, please, your point of view. Thank you, Michael. So I had, uh, yeah, thank you for those slides. If we can go to next, please. Uh, Heights already frame uh, a bit of. Uh, what Europe is doing to recover from the corona crisis. And I wa wanted to share with uh, the audience two things. First, uh, the two documents that if you have not read them, please read them, is the proposal of the Commission for the Next Generation EU uh, program, recovery program and where, in which topics uh, to invest and to spend that money. Remember that the money is 750 billion, that is three times the GDP of Denmark. So again, that program is massive. And the second document is the next uh, 18 months of the three presidencies, namely Germany, Portugal, and Slovenia, because those will be pretty much aligned in terms of 
how to implement those measures. The good news for this audience is that already in the first document, the European Battery Alliance and everything that it entails, it's identified at the core of the EU recovery package and to be fast-tracked. Okay, so the framing is good. Next slide, please. The documents, by the way, are pretty uh, short. It's 20, 25 pages. So again, I, uh, I counsel the, the audience to read them. Then uh, what we have done uh, in the EBA lately, as you know, energy was mandated by the Commission to lead the, the, industrial, the industrial stream of the European Battery Alliance in October 2017 in a very symbiosis and symbiotic approach together with the Commission and other stakeholders. I think it has been working nicely. And the last event that we gathered was the 19th of May. And why is that even relevant? Well, first, because of the, uh, of the institutions around. On top of the slide on the left, you have both the Vice President Zefko, which has been the sponsor and the reference since the beginning, but also the money side, that is uh, VP Andrew McDowell from the EIB. As you know, the EIB has been supporting Nolfold and LG and Umicore, so and they are playing absolutely as the bank of the Commission in the policy making, which is good. And then, as Hazi was saying, you have all the players of the value chain that, uh, well, for that meeting, they were relevant. And good news, you have already lithium and conversion guys. So I can share with the audience that uh, today there are projects with mining and conversion in Europe that can supply 80% of the needs of the battery value chain by 2025. I repeat, 8-0, 80%. We also see coming new players like Orano in uh, recycling, like a Schneider in uh, automation. So again, the EBA ecosystem is thriving. And those, uh, ladies and gentlemen, what they did is to propose to the Commission 20 measures that are on the right side of the screen to accelerate EBA with a commitment that if those measures are deployed, the battery value chain can create 1 million jobs, I repeat, 1 million jobs, and bring 210 billion euros of new GDP in the next 30 months. Those 20 measures are in the remit of the Member States, of the Commission, of the industry, of course, and uh, since uh, the culture of the EBA has been so successful because everybody has been pushing for the same objective, I've got no doubt that, that they will resonate in the Commission agenda. It's confidential, of course, until the Commission lifts up the, um, the, the secrecy of the discussions. But uh, you see that the net is 210 billion euros of new GDP in the next 30 months. That, by the way, is what Europe requires to reignite the economy after Corona. And then the last slide, please. So the punch message that I want to share uh, with uh, uh, this audience is uh, that accelerating EBA was already running at the right pace, but if we accelerate with those 21 measures, then those industrial players, they can commit that we can mobilize and leverage new 1 million jobs and additional 210 billion in the next 30 months. Again, uh, it's a very clear plan with a very clear impact, both in terms of jobs, growth, and sustainable energy economy. Thank you. Over to you, Michael. Thank you. Yeah. Uh, thank, thank you. Thank you very much, uh, uh, Diego. Um, maybe uh, to, to uh, before we go to the uh, to, to the question and answer session from the from the audience. Uh, to both of you, what, what in your mind are the main obstacles uh, we need to to overcome, and maybe in particular in the in the short term? That's it. Great, Diego. Are you waiting for me? That's okay. <laughs> All right. Um, so yeah, main obstacles. Um, I think that uh, the the most important thing that I would see is that we have over the last few years, put an enormous amount of work into getting um, the work on the next generation of batteries off the ground here in Europe, from the perspective of building a value chain towards developing the right technologies, towards making sure that batteries are sustainable. The biggest obstacle I think that we face right now is to make sure that everything that happens from now on is as coherent and coordinated as possible so that we don't have like multiple uh, uh, 
activities running in parallel or trying to do the same thing. So I think there, again, uh, the fact that we have um, the uh, technology and innovation partnership is going to be a major help there. And all the actors that we, we have on the ground now, I think, are aware of this. Um, the next thing I think that is going to be important as well is that we um, we try not to see batteries as, um, how shall I put it, um, a single, uh, uh, a one-track uh, kind of exercise. It's not just about one particular aspect of what the new decarbonized economy will be about, but there are multiple aspects there, um, both in terms of mobility, but also in terms of storage more broadly. Um, and this may also mean um, batteries which fundamentally have uh, similar forms of technology in there, but which are not necessarily similar uh, or exactly the same, depending on what it is that you're looking at. Um, for me, this is quite important because um, even in the context of mobility, you have different types of batteries that might be useful. Uh, it could be for cars, uh, but it could also be for airplanes, for example. Um, uh, in the context of storage, uh, the reaction time of batteries that you need for different types of storage may be different. So I think those are the, the kind of things that we have to look at um, in terms of the, the obstacles that I see. And then I'm, I'm sure that uh, Mattia, for example, or, or James will tell us things from the industrial environmental perspective. Sustainability is a challenge. But I think if we can work out the best way in which to handle the sustainability aspects, for example, rather than focusing on uh, what are difficulties right now, uh, that will move us quite a bit forward as well. I think that's as much as I want to say here right now. I leave it uh, to you then, uh, Diego. Yeah, so if I, if I may, Michael, so three. Uh, so it's, uh, is it retainable by the audience? For me, number one will be, and I'm looking at the Mattia, uh, is that the, the battery directive that is going to come in the fall is fit for purpose. So that we don't try to do the optimal, uh, but that we do something uh, good enough so that allows the market and the value chain to thrive. <clears throat> Number two will be about permitting. Today, uh, all the mining and conversion projects that we are supporting in Portugal, in Spain, in Czechia, in Alsace, in Alsace, blah, blah, they need seven years altogether to get the permits, the environmental impact assessment. So uh, we don't want to cut corners but fast tracking uh, those permitting processes will be a huge help to bring back industry into Europe. And the third one, at the end, an EV or a home storage plus PV. At the end, in the transaction, there is a business and a consumer, so a citizen, so us. So today, the perception of us citizens to acquire a new goodie, be it an electrical vehicle or being home storage uh, plus a PV, we need still to do some awareness, pedagogy, and education. Because at the end, the transaction will only happen, demand will only happen, the value chain will only be pulled if the off-takers, that at the end is going to be us as citizens, are fully comfortable in transacting. Thank you. So yes, indeed, we see that uh, the, the challenge is quite, uh, quite huge in, in, in front of us. Uh, and it is uh, in multiple directions. Uh, it is both regulation, uh, it is both uh, technology, uh, and uh, and uh, and uh, permitting. For example, it's uh, it's also uh, 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 bureaucracy and, and processes. Let's see what our audience uh, thinks about this before we go to the questions. Uh, can you call? Can you bring up the word word cloud two? So just a, as, a, as a quick input, what do you think, audience, is the main or will be the main challenges to reach the full potential for batteries in the future fully integrated energy system? Single one or two words, please. Recycling comes up. Very interesting uh, that uh, recycling uh, resources uh, seems to be uh, quite important. Regulation is 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 also in there. 
And now all of a sudden it, it comes with performance. Though, so this goes along with, uh, with uh, technology R&D. Well, we can leave this open uh, a little bit, but I would like uh, to give a chance to answer to some of the questions from the audience also. Uh, so can we see uh, what were the questions that have been put from the audience? So do you see hydrogen as a competitor of the batteries or the two can complement each other? Uh... So for me, that's easy. I can jump in Michael if you want. Yes. Yeah. So uh, what is the beauty of batteries? That batteries and the off-take segments are many. Is electromobility, is ESS, is grid frequency and voltage control, it's uh, uh, hybridization with renewables. So the speed of lessons learned that will be reincorporated in the future products uh, are massive. That, uh, that's, the, for, for me, the key big difference together with hydro, uh, vis -vis hydrogen. Hydrogen definitely has a, play, a role to play. In uh, mobility, I think it will be marginal. That's uh, my own uh, assessment. In terms of uh, sector coupling, it definitely will be the key player. So I think we should not be opposing hydrogen to, uh, to batteries. They will just be coexisting, but each one of the technologies is fit for purpose on the segment they're addressing. Thank you. I pretty much uh, uh, agree. In fact, both are complementing each other. Uh, there were also a lot of questions around uh, how can we competitive in particular to China? So how will the EU make sure that it doesn't lose leadership uh, compared to, to China, uh, as it happened with, with solar. Heizer, would you uh, want to comment on this? Yes, and I'm sure that, uh, that uh, James might have something to say on that later on as well, as, uh, as, might, uh, as might Diego. Um, I also wanted to say quickly something a bit uh, about hydrogen. I'm, I'm not entirely sure that I agree with you, uh, Diego, that it will be marginal in terms of mobility. Uh, there is quite a bit of potential there, and I think it's a whole discussion that we still need to have. But where I fully agree with is that it's complementary. It is uh, an energy transport um, vector, if you will, hydrogen. And we can use it for storage. We can use it as an energy source uh, or an energy uh, storage in terms of liquid, like you would use liquid uh, and fuels. Um, we can use it as something to transport energy over large distances via pipelines and so forth and so on. But the sort of potential is there. So it's very complementary to batteries. Now, on regard to, uh, with regard to everything that's leadership, with regard to, to China and so on and so on, um, again, you know, I think there are others here who have more insight as to the specifics of where we are technology right now. Um, but for me, the main thing is that what we're trying to do now is to build the next generation of batteries and to make sure that in doing so, we build a way to have the whole value chain for the battery production in Europe and to do that in a way that, that is really competitive uh, internationally. But there is something that needs to be uh, kept in mind there as well. And this plays, I think, for every sector that we're looking at, and not just batteries, that is that if we as Europe want to compete, uh, we will never be able to compete uh, just on price. It will always have to be on innovation, on quality, on being top of the game. And I think the same goes for what it is that we're trying to develop with, uh, with batteries. If All I can right. add, Michael, on, on the competition with China, uh, let's reflect on three facts. Uh, sorry, James, to take the word. The first fact is, why would LG, CATL, SK relocate into Europe? I mean, they have done their homework. So why they are coming here? The biggest battery plant in the world of LG is in Europe, in, in Poland. So why would they come? So the answer is pretty much on two things. First, when you look at the bill of materials of a battery, compared to the bill of materials of PV, you see two things that are uh, completely changing the, the, the ball game. Number one is that uh, the labor uh, weight on the battery is scarcely 7%, scarcely. Number two, the price of energy in Europe, uh, it's in many places extremely attractive compared to other prices elsewhere. And number three, the cost of capital. Back in uh, 15 years back, when the PV war was there, and the cost of capital uh, was absolutely abused by the Chinese to make the whole uh, run for free for the Chinese uh, producers. Now, the cost of capital, as we know, is almost non-existing, even negative in some places. So if the big players are coming to Europe, 
is because I've done all the maths and uh, it's uh, the place to be. So there is no reason not to invest in, in Europe. We have all the conditions to, uh, to, to invest. Uh, what we still need, of course, is technology on the one hand, and, and now it is a perfect transition uh, to our second block, uh, questions about sustainability and recycling. We do have a number of questions on this, and I really do not want to scrap them. I would like to keep them at the end of our following uh, block, and uh, I would therefore want to, to introduce this second block, discuss uh, about uh, sustainability and recycling, and then come back to these uh, questions, please. So can I have, uh, uh, thank you very much for, to, to Heitze and uh, who is going to leave us and, uh, and Diego, but you, you, you stay online, please. So can I introduce the second slot? Yes, fine, thank you. Um, well, we are talking about a globally competitive value chain. I think we agree that this is what we want to achieve. It is not only about uh, building gigafactories for batteries in, in, in Europe. Uh, it needs to take into account the entire value chain. So from raw materials to cell components, cell and battery manufacturing, through uh, the different application areas and usage areas, uh, electric vehicles, but also others, and then back to recycling technologies. Uh, the challenges we have here are competitiveness. We need to be become bigger and we need to be sustainable and with a low CO2 footprint. And these challenges are interconnected. Uh, we cannot look at them uh, in, an, in an isolated way. Now, sustainability in particular is uh, 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 an important part of this, and it may be in the future the main differentiation or a significant differentiation factor of European technology and European capabilities compared to, to others. With this in mind, uh, let's uh, look a little bit more in what uh, is on the European agenda with regards to uh, recycling and, and sustainability. So I pass the floor uh, to Mattia, please. Thank you very much. Uh, suppose the slides uh, will be shown. Yes, indeed. So, um, can you move to the next uh, slide? Yeah, so in, uh, I think what is important, I think was mentioned by a number of you, is the fact that. Uh, um, there has been uh, a number of efforts to create a European value chain of batteries, uh, notably in the field of uh, both state aids, but also uh, having European uh, support. Uh, what is missing now is uh, the regulatory framework. Indeed, uh, you need the different pillars in order to have uh, a, a, a a clear framework which can uh, facilitate the production of, of uh, batteries in Europe. Uh, you may be aware that the current batteries directive is very old. It dates back to 2006, and more importantly, it does not take into account uh, a number of technological uh, development. So the market has been changing uh, significantly in the meanwhile. Uh, I'm referring here not only to electric uh, vehicles, uh, which will be really the, the future of Europe, but at the same time, there has been also a number of uh, light mobilities um, let's say, um, uh, light mobility equipments like uh, electric scooters, uh, e-bikes, which, which have been emerging over the last uh, few years. Uh, so this is one that has been new market trends, both in terms of size and diversity. Uh, at the same time, uh, there is the issue that was mentioned by Michael Leeds about uh, carbon neutrality. So batteries are seen by the um, politicians in Europe as the only way to reach carbon neutrality by 2050. And indeed also, uh, this is the lesson of the COVID. Uh, uh, the, the, the COVID, uh, to put it in the words of our president, of the president of the commission, what, what has shown the COVID uh, is that our value chains are too long. So indeed, we need to make our value chains much more uh, circular. We need to close the loop. And this is uh, indeed all the area of uh, circular economy. So that's uh, uh, also COVID, by the way, what has shown is that when you look at uh, data, 
uh, while the sales of cars have been going down, the same has not applied to electric cars. So this is, uh, is another interesting economic sign uh, that uh, the future of the market is the electric cars. And also, interestingly enough, a number of member states like Germany or France have been taking specific uh, schemes now post-COVID to support uh, the changing of uh, con uh, conventional cars into electric cars. So these are only a number of challenges, but also clear um, indication of where the future is going. Uh, of course, uh, in doing that, I mean, the Commission has taken this into account both in the Green Deal and in the Circular Economy Action Plan. So in the Green Deal, as you know, uh, I think based on my experience, uh, which is about uh, 20 years of experience in the institution in many different DGs, is the first time that I see in such a, a, a broad policy document uh, paper uh, that there is uh, even a deadline for adoption of a legal instrument. So you may be aware that in the Green Deal is clearly said that not only that uh, the battery's uh, new regulation will be adopted in 2020, but there is written the date of October. I can also tell you that uh, uh, this is really a date which is uh, cast in stone. So we have been uh, working against the clock to produce a fully fledged impact assessment. So you can see the status of my uh, beard and, uh, and uh, I mean, really we've been working uh, uh, flat hours to produce an impact assessment, uh, which actually was submitted uh, yesterday to the regulatory scrutiny board of the commission uh, in view of an adoption of the uh, batteries uh, regulation in October of this year. So indeed, uh, uh, there is a lot of, of attention. Of course, in producing this impact assessment, uh, we have consulted largely with stakeholders, but we also have taken into account the will of our uh, College of Commissioners uh, and the, the indications which are contained in the Circular Economy Action Plan. You may be aware that in the Circular Economy Action Plan, we have a certain uh, clear uh, guidance uh, in terms of electric vehicles, in terms of uh, carbon footprint uh, and uh, due diligence for the raw materials. We also have clear guidance in terms of uh, recycled content and the need to consider that in the new regulation. And we also have clear guidance as regards the small portable batteries, so the ones which you, we use all of us as consumers at home, in terms of uh, uh, phasing out uh, the non-rechargeable uh, ones. So these are clear indications which are contained in the Circular Economy Action Plan. So next slide. What is also important to be taken into account, and that is really a challenge in my view, is that, uh, um, and indeed it was mentioned by some of the previous intervention, is that uh, uh, differently from many pieces of legislation, at least I have uh, seven legislative revisions in my unit uh, to be done in the year as part of the Green Deal. I don't know how, uh, if we will manage, but we will try to, to do it. But this is the only one where you are regulating the future. So that is a very complex, uh, so what we have been doing through the impact assessment, we have realized that it's very complicated because we are, we know that there will be a growth, but you have to estimate that growth. We've been working also with the Joint Research Center. Here you have um, some examples of what the dimension of the growth. As you can see, uh, from now to 2030, the market uh, for um, batteries will increase at least of 14 times. And Europe, uh, it is already now and will remain the second uh, global market. What is also interesting, and this goes in line to what uh, you, Michael, you were saying, is that uh, when, and we've been collecting data for the impact assessment, and when you look at each of the stages of the um, life cycle of a battery, so starting with the sourcing, each of these stages is likely to increase by a factor of 10. So the increase is not an increase only of the market, but each of the stages being the sourcing of the raw materials, being the production, being the recycling, each of them uh, is going to increase uh, with an average of a factor of 10. So really, this makes a uh, challenge, interesting, but also I think really uh, very difficult to regulate the market, which is not an existing market, but is a market that will be uh, created. Uh, next slide. Mattia, if I may ask you to, to accelerate slightly so we have enough time left for the questions. So the objectives will be three of this uh, um, new regulatory framework, to strengthen the internal market, 
to close the loop, as I said, to make short the value chains, and, and the third one, to reduce the environmental and social impacts. If we go to the next uh, slide, here you will understand some of the measures which will be in the new regulation. And as you can see, in line to what we just uh, discussed, uh, the new framework will cover the full uh, life cycle assessment uh, from uh, the uh, mining and processing, where um, we will have uh, uh, rules on responsible sourcing, then the batteries production, so how you place batteries into the market, uh, where there will be rules on uh, carbon footprint, on hazardous components, and also recycled content, as I mentioned. Then uh, the uh, primary use, uh, so that there will be some uh, performance and lifetime requirements. And then uh, we will also include the provisions for second life. Of course, we will have to be very delicate uh, here because we need to ensure the right balance between uh, direct recycling, which uh, we know that some of the producers, they would like the battery go to go straight uh, back to recycling, and other uses such as energy storage. So then there will be this type of balance. Of course, there will be new collection targets for all type of batteries, which of course will be different, these collection tar targets. And there will be specific rules on extended producer responsibility and consumer rights. And of course, I mean, in the recycling phase, there will be also new recycling efficiencies. So these are all the type of measures which will be in the new framework. Of course, if there are questions, I can provide more uh, details on that. Um, I think next slide and um, yeah. Uh, indeed, as you said, we are really uh, trying to, to create this new market in Europe to facilitate actually the creation of that market in a way that is a sustainable uh, market. So I think if time was limited, so I'm already over, so I give it uh, back to you. Yes, thank you very much, uh, Mattia. And without any further transition, I give the floor to Emma Nierenheim. Uh, very pleased to, to, to have a, a colleague from the industry, and uh, we are keen to, to, to understand uh, your point of view uh, from Norfolk. Emma, the floor is yours. Thank you so much, everyone. And, and really, thank you for the presentation so far. I think it's a very important discussion and I think that there are so many contributions that together will play this out very very well for the European market. Uh, one important thing uh, hearing from Atia, the last speaker is that when when we design this we really need to take care of the the quality of the data that is produced so with everything we do we need to make sure that the traceability and the quality of what we measure and how things are measured and determined um, are to the level that it can actually contribute to, to a sustainable future for, for the planet. And next slide, please. And the, the most important thing when, when we talk about this segment and all is that batteries will enable a higher rate of renewable energy. I mean, this is what we are aiming for. We've seen um, generations of renewable energy being introduced to the market, and there are limits in how it can be used, and storage is the mean to how we can actually increase the rate of renewable energy in the grid and on the, on the entire uh, planet. And I think that it's very important that we remember that this is why we are all here uh, and why we are driving this transition towards electrification. It's the most efficient way to move renewable energy in the grid and, and, and in time, actually. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, and also for the transportation uh, sector, I think it's so incredibly important because this sector so far with the fuels used uh, has not at all been able to benefit from that uh, renewable energy. And I also think that it's so incredibly important to study the markets uh, uh, where we already have an in introduction of, of EVs. Uh, take, for instance, Norway. Uh, for, for anyone who is interested in recycling, I think that is pretty amazing, the recycling uh, structures that are being built in Norway uh, and how that market is bold, setting very strong targets uh, and really taking the responsibility uh, of introducing EVs 
uh, in a very fast pace. So next slide, please, a little bit on how we see this in Northvolt. Um, talking about 100% renewable energy means that we have to do it for real. We have to connect real renewable energy uh, to the actual production steps. We have to make sure that we take a bigger responsibility of everything that we do, that we introduce uh, carbon emission lowering uh, measures that are for real in the life cycle. And when we do life cycle assessments, everyone who's used that kind of tool knows that uh, it's really about how to define the categories, how to define the impacts uh, that sets then later what will be the uh, what will be driving uh, the change on that market. So we really have to make sure that it's incentivizing renewable energy um, expansions uh, in every country, and that it's also incentivizing recycling. So making sure that recycled batteries uh, can really benefit from, from all the, uh, the up environmental upsides uh, that are to be found, uh, and, and that this is built into that model. And I'm particularly uh, thinking about the, the product environmental footprint uh, platform that I think is going to be a huge success for, for Europe going forward. Um, and, uh, and, and also, when we look ahead, I think that it's also very important to consider that uh, there are so many environmental impacts that we maybe are not considering today, but, but will be a huge issue in the future. And, uh, and we as a company have decided that when we're building this industry, uh, we don't want to look ahead 20 years and find ourselves in a new uh, environmental struggle with something that we just didn't think of. Because we are now well educated, we do understand that it's more than, than, than climate change that we need to think about. Uh, I'm particularly thinking about what we discharge into the, uh, to the oceans. We have to think about uh, the materials that we import to Europe. That's a matter of, uh, of market. Uh, it's a, ma a matter of ensuring the raw material feed, but it's also a matter of if we, if we use raw materials that uh, in the case of battery production normally are elements, that these are actually being reused again in the second, uh, third, fourth and so forth life of one battery or, or new batteries. So regardless of how we reuse or recycle, uh, we think it's incredibly important that the raw materials that we take out from the, from the earth, uh, that that particular element is being recycled because it can be recycled as in contrary to uh, to a fossil fuel that by de definition becomes a carbon dioxide, uh, a battery material, which is an element, uh, can be recovered in its pure form and recycled into the battery loop. And I think that my time is out, so uh, we leave it there for now. Very interesting. Thank you very much, uh, uh, Emma. I would have some direct questions, but as we are running out of time, I really uh, prefer to to interact a little bit uh, with the with the audience. Uh, can we call up for pool two, please? So we have uh, poll two. Yes. Uh, so so uh, as a as a quick uh, poll. Uh, what do you think, uh, dear audience, for Europe to be able to manufacture sustainable batteries? What actions are most important? You can choose one or two options out of the seven we, we propose here. And we leave it on just for a couple of seconds to see what the audience thinks. Well, the legal framework uh, is, is uh, yeah, <laughs> the framework and research and innovation are, are important. I think the fact that there is not a clear single answer reflects pretty much the situation. 
we don't have a silver bullet. Uh, we absolutely need to work uh, together on all the uh, uh, in all the areas. It's research and innovation, uh, the legal framework, uh, globally uh, 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 investment into uh, into manufacturing, and we need to do this uh, quick and, and uh, simultaneously. Uh, we leave the question, this, this poll still open, but I would like to go uh, to see the, um, the questions from uh, the audience, please. And we have seen them uh, already uh, before. So can, can we say, uh, can we define what could be an ambitious share for battery recycling? Uh, and uh, can can we formulate what could be the expectation from the Commission? I I do need to answer. I do need to ask you to answer uh, as much as possible uh, uh, in with with a quick and sharp answer to this. Um, maybe Mattia on the first question. So on the first question, so it depends on what type of batteries. So there will be different category of batteries in this new batteries um, regulation. So portable batteries, industrial batteries, which will then we need to be divided because we are even considering a standalone category for electric uh, vehicles batteries because that will be a very big market. So for portable batteries, uh, uh, the ones we use, as I said, every day at home, the, the, the recycling rate, the current one in the current uh, legal framework is 45%, which is not achieved by the majority of member states. So we are likely to increase, but uh, uh, we have three options, which we have assessed 55, 65, and 75% of recycling um, uh, rate, of collection rate. For electric vehicles, I think the idea, as Emma said, that there is to go really for a full circularity because we don't want any of these batteries to be lost. So there we will certainly have an obligation in terms of really ensuring that all of them go back, go back to, to recycling. And for some of the light mobility, like e-bikes and, um, and scooters and e scooters uh, that is a new category which we are also assessing and uh, on that one is uh, we're looking to different options now we have seen on your slides that there will be a wave of batteries coming but the wave that reaches the recycling facilities is still 10 years ahead of us so uh, would you differentiate uh, your your ambitions uh, from now until the next 10 or 20 years Yes, this is um, indeed. Uh, so uh, this is what we are trying to do. Then, uh, of course, I cannot reply for politicians. But um, indeed, in assessing that, uh, especially as I mentioned, uh, there is a strong political will to have recycled content obligations, notably for the active materials, so like cobalt, lithium, uh, manganese, uh, uh, graphite. So in this case, uh, of course, uh, um, our analysis so far is showing that the earliest possible date to introduce some level of mandatory recycled content will not be before 2030. And, uh, and then to increase that level, probably we have to move to 2035. Of course, what we can already do in terms of transparency, we can already ask that any producer of batteries, which is, which is placed into the European market their batteries, they have to declare the amount of recycled content. So the idea would be to proceed uh, uh, in, in three different steps. This is uh, what we are proposing now at a technical level. One step would be everybody has to declare the amount of recycled content, if any, and this will be immediate as, as the, with the day of entry into force. Then 2030, we will go gradually in with some targets of recycled content, and then 2035, we will increase uh, that level of recycled content, taking into account uh, the availability of materials, as you were saying, of batteries in the market. Emma, on your side at Northwold, do you have a vision or uh, maybe even objectives on uh, the uh, amount of uh, recycled materials and the degree of recyclability you, you want or you may be able to achieve? Yes, of course we have. Uh, our our target, which is very bold and ambitious, but that's the same with the entire ambition for the company, is 50% recycled material in the batteries 2030. 
And uh, uh, I think that on those kind of targets, we can be bold. Uh, what I think that re needs um, regulation, and I'm saying this because I spent a fair share of time now in in the workshops together with my team, is to make sure that we are that batteries that become critical are not halted anywhere. So that we make sure that there is a gate for every battery that that is uh, ending up in the end of life, either because there was an accident or for any other reason. So there. A framework is needed for the early stages, uh, for, for the reason of safety and for the reason of that battery not leaving Europe. Uh, I think that's key. Um, when it comes to the real end of life batteries, I'm expecting that they will have a path back to the market from, uh, from uh, the, the, the end customer to the, to the car manufacturer to the producer of the battery. Well, there's see, a there's question, great for you, could yes. you quickly answer to this, do you take into account recyclability at the beginning or, or when you design batteries? We are, uh, definitely. Uh, we are uh, talking a lot about that. It, uh, uh, it, has, uh, it has a lot to do with the, the, the simplicity of the, of the materials, uh, how, what kind of materials we use, and, and then it's all also about optimizing and, and planning production and recycling production uh, to make sure that we have clear, uh, pure feeds. Uh, we have, and uh, thank you for, for this. Uh, we have, uh, say, two more critical uh, points here, in particular the question about cobalt uh, uh, coming on. Um, would you, uh, would, would uh, you, Mattia, uh, want to? comment on, on cobalt in particular. And there is also one question, what, what, is the, what is the regulatory framework specifically to favor uh, collection or recycling for EV batteries? Uh, and Emma has already given some, some hints on, on this. Do you agree uh, from the European point of view? So Mattia, could you shortly comment on these two questions, cobalt and the fr regulatory framework for EV batteries? Yeah, so on, on cobalt, uh, I can confirm that the idea is to have also some uh, due diligence um, obligations in the regulation for uh, cobalt, but also for uh, lithium. Um, you may be aware that there is already a European legislation on conflict minerals, notably which covers the three T's, uh, tin, tungsten and uh, tantalum, plus uh, gold. But there is no specific one for uh, cobalt and lithium, which are heavily used in the production of electric, uh, sorry, of, um, of um, batteries for electric vehicles. So uh, the idea indeed is to develop uh, some, uh, to have some uh, um, obligation in terms of uh, information obligation to be provided by the producer of the battery. Of course, the, all the details will have to be implemented later on via a standard. So the idea is that many of these obligations I'm mentioning will be then developed uh, through a standardization mandate, which normally should be adopted at the same time of the new batteries uh, regulation. As regards um, what is the regulatory framework that you need uh, to facilitate uh, electric uh, batteries uh, recycling, I think you need a number of, of elements. One is ambitious recycling targets and collection targets. Two, ambitious recycling efficiency. Uh, three, um, recycled content that will uh, then become like an obligation to put it back into the, in the, in, into the new type of batteries. Of course, this, as I said, will kick in at a later stage. And also you need uh, um, a specific provision on the design of the battery, which we will also include, of course, it will also be the question that was raised earlier on by one of the participants is indeed a very good question. You have to take into account the recycling elements already at the stage of the design. So that will also be contained in the new regulatory mm -hmm. framework. Maybe as a last point, we earlier heard that 80% of the needs, of the material needs, uh, could be provided by 2035 in, in Europe. Uh, but there is the question, if all vehicles would be electrified in this century, is there enough raw materials in Europe? Yeah, that, that's a very good question. Is it to anybody else? 
in the panel if anybody wants to to comment on this yeah uh, I, I was talking about you go here i was talking about lithium so lithium there is enough lithium in europe to feed the beast mm -hmm. and the beast is around a thousand gigawatt hours per year of new production capacity without recycling so there is enough lithium in europe at the right price of course <laughs> matthias you wanted to comment yeah on I, I mean that question yeah that question is close to my heart because you may be aware that uh, for six years i've been uh, the head of unit for raw materials in the commission so now i'm doing a different job on them look at secondary raw materials but for six years i was dealing with primary raw materials so and uh, indeed, uh, um, the reason, of course, there is plenty of projects, there is plenty of potential of in terms of geological potential. There is a lot of geological potential in Europe. Uh, and uh, at the same time, I think this is a good reason why we need to increase also recycling. Because, of course, you need primary production, but you also need uh, to make sure that everybody producing the way of, uh, of our colleagues of uh, North Fort, which they really want to, to, to go to the highest um, possible level of recycling. And I think we have to, via this regulation, make sure that all producers in Europe, or whoever wants to place these batteries in Europe, will be um, will have to comply with these uh, ambitious environmental rules, also in terms of uh, recycling. All right. With this, I'm sorry we were not able to answer all of the questions, but I think uh, we, we, we captured uh, quite a couple of them. I would now like to go to the third block of, uh, of our uh, conference and uh, talk more along about the, the longer perspective. Uh, obviously, technology innovation is a major contributor to achieve a European leadership position in sustainable battery technologies also in manufacturing and industrial capacity and, and global competitiveness. It's, a, it's a, an important contributor uh, on the short, medium and long term. And I think uh, uh, you, you, you agree uh, with me, uh, and in particular James and Christina, uh, that we need to look uh, at these different time horizons and not neglect any of them. Um, I, hand the floor first to, to James Copping uh, to talk to us from a more uh, education and, uh, and skills perspective. And uh, then we will uh, uh, end with uh, Christina, who gives us a, a practical approach and maybe some insights in what uh, is on the roadmap for the batteries uh, on, the, on these time horizons. Uh, James, the floor is yours. Okay, thank you very much, uh, Michael. Just, um, I'm going to give you a, um, a policy overview, really, of what we want to do in this area in terms of um, support available for skills and their importance, and also uh, really but why we're um, uh, looking at this issue uh, so much in the area of, of batteries. I'm going to sort of edit my speaking notes as I go along, just to, so we can try and catch up with a little bit of time. Um, so, uh, yeah, thank you very much. So, um, it's of course it's important to realise that um, the European economy was already undergoing a major industrial transformation um, ahead of the COVID crisis that we're going through now. In the automotive sector, which I uh, know best, we have of course the environmental push, which is exactly what we've been talking now and the object uh, about now and the objectives we have there. But we also have a revolution in industrial processes and the way we're manufacturing things and developing things is is a huge revolution in itself and and um, uh, would have uh, be a major talking point if we didn't have other things to to discuss um, and the batteries are going to be at the heart of the key enabling uh, it was a key enabling technology for the transformation of in particular to low uh, emission mobility but of course also for energy storage um, that is going to be so important as well um, so batteries have been a, a priority for the Commission for uh, at, at least uh, the last two or three years. They've always been a priority in research, but in all parts of industrial policy, it's becoming a, a priority. The key issue for us was to establish a um, complete uh, value chain, uh, right from uh, accessing uh, raw materials through to production to recycling. 
and the realization that Europe was uh, weak, in particular in some areas. In particular, there was no large, was no large scale battery manufacturing, cell manufacturing in Europe, little production of uh, raw materials, no uh, refining capacity. And this is something we wanted to uh, tackle because um, we, uh, supported by member states and industry, have identified the battery value chain as being a strategic one for the economy as a whole, on which a lot else uh, uh, depends. So this was the start of the European Battery Alliance, which has been made, uh, uh, which has been discussed before, which br brings together the member states and the European institutions, the European Investment Bank, um, Diego uh, with uh, Inno Energy, and um, uh, bring together uh, a number of players to come up with a strategy to tackle this issue and provide pr practical measures to create this complete, innovative and globally competitive but at the same time, sustainable um, uh, battery value chain. A key part of this work will be the, the legislative framework, which uh, Matera has just uh, um, talked about now. Um, but we're already seeing some Im impressive uh, results. Um, thanks to Inno Energy, there are lots of projects that are happening uh, well under the way in, uh, throughout the ecosystem, the battery ecosystem. Northvolt has led the way in uh, the, the approach to developing uh, uh, factories and also the sort of the vertical integration of, uh, of their uh, supply chain with particularly challenging uh, sustainability requirements, which is very welcome. We also have um, the the tool that the European Commission has been promoting a lot, which is the important projects of common European interest and the launch of a major consortium with 17 companies from seven member states, uh, raising up to 3.2 billion in state aid and a further 5 billion, up to 5 billion in, in private sector investment. This, is, this could really help transform uh, the battery ecosystem in Europe. And there's another even potentially even larger uh, ecosystem, uh, uh, sorry, um, uh, IPCI project on the way as well for later this, this year. Our, even though we have the projects in place, we're getting the financing in place. One of the things that we are often desperately lacking is the skilled workers in the same areas. We, um, and even before the um, uh, COVID under normal circumstances, we were having, uh, I, I understand, the 70% of companies were reporting that they were having to delay investment decisions um, as a result of the lack of the, the right skilled people in place. So this is not a new issue, but it's going to be particularly uh, important in the, in the battery sector. So, um, and this is not a surprise, we're trying to develop an ecosystem almost from scratch. There are some important elements already in place like recycling and so on, but the mass battery production is uh, uh, missing as well as some other areas. And so we have, it's not surprising that we don't have the workers that have the experience in battery cell technologies, in mining, in refining, in uh, physical chemistry, chemistry, cell design, the safe use of battery, and, and many other skills which we need. So, um, we also uh, need to ensure that we have the people there that, through the research that we develop the innovation, uh, which will be a key to the future uh, competitiveness and sustainability success of the uh, battery structure in Europe in the years to come. So we, um, under the, uh, what I'm very pleased to say is under the new, the recovery plan, the next generation EU, the Commission has identified a number of, uh, of uh, so the substantial funding available, as, as Diego mentioned, 750 billion. Um, and in, in that, a number of funds are, uh, are being either reinforced or created, um, the, including the Just Transition Fund of up to 140 billion, which is um, designed to help with socio-economic impacts um, uh, from the crisis, including reskilling. You have the existing European Social Fund, which has been uh, reinforced up to 101 billion. And you have the European Globalization Adjustment Fund, which is the support for integration into the labor market as a result of financial crises, of course, which one we're experiencing uh, now. And we already had the launch of uh, Shore, which is um, to help keep people in work or already and also by time uh, for reskilling. These are uh, short term but substantial 
measures. The key issue is to look at the long term. How do we get the um, the engineers, the researchers, the, the technical assistants, the skilled workers we need for, for the future? Um, we will have um, very shortly, the Commission will announce its new skills agenda, which will expect uh, will include a proposal for a skills pact in which certain industries that are prepared to work together with uh, member states, social partners, other stakeholders like educational institutions to create a single framework um, for identifying uh, the skills that are needed and a pathway to, to get there. Um, and we'll also look, I think, uh, this the strategy will announce um, a, a skills intelligence approach to try and identify what skills we have and what skills that we will need so we can plan more effectively in the future to, to meet that demand. I have uh, a strong, uh, I, I believe that the automotive sector, in, in particular the electrification part of it, will be a strong candidate. Um, to to take part in this uh, skills pack, but of course that remains to be seen. Um, but we're not starting from scratch. We have, at the beginning of this year, we launched uh, through the DG Employment's uh, Blueprint Skills Program, All Bats, um, which is uh, looking at uh, um, developing a strategy for skills in the battery sector, which uh, Northvolt is a part. There are 20 partners from 10 member states, uh, uh, led by Skeletity, a municipality in, in Sweden. And we're looking at developing competencies required for the battery value chain and a strategy to draft for curricula and learning materials for national qualification frameworks. So that's not going to deliver overnight, but we hope and we uh, expect with the already significant progress they're making that this will be a substantial uh, um, uh, contribution for the future. And already um, to help with the crisis, they've identified a number of uh, existing online skills courses uh, which are available to help um, uh, uh, industries and workers to, to reskill in this area during the lockdown. Uh, so very quickly, um, in uh, in conclusion, really, that, you know, our recovery, uh, the Commission's intention of the recovery is that it will be uh, focus on green objectives, more digital, and to develop a more resilient economy. I mean, the, the, the fact that our supply chains are so long, as been mentioned already, and a more circular approach. And batteries are right at the heart of this. It's all about um, building a, uh, a greater autonomy, resilience in the economy in a strategic area, which will also have a vital area, a vital role to play in our sustainability uh, objectives and to really transform um, the uh, mobility area, which is the one that I know, know best. The substantial instruments under and financing available in, in place. And it's very, I think on this point, it's very important to note that Certainly for the first time in my experience, uh, when it, huge major projects are being put together in terms of industrialized policies, everything, you see skills there right at the heart of the Commission's uh, uh, approach and with potentially significant funding to back that up. But uh, at that point, I will stop. Thank you very much. Thank you, James. So uh, quite impressing uh, the, the different policy and financial instruments. Now, Christina, do we spend them on the right things? You will tell us what you believe we should uh, invest on. I will, and I will try to do it very briefly. I think you left me with three minutes or something. But um, I, I wish the slides could come up also for my presentation, please. Uh, so um, we have talked about the battery ecosystem and how important it is to build the whole value chain. And to do that, you really need also to think research. And it was neat to see that the poll, the research and innovation was really appreciated among our uh, listeners on this conference. And uh, for Battery 2030 Plus, we try to be long-term and visionary. Uh, I once said to one uh, from industry, I think we try to make the sustainable battery we can put on the moon or on Mars. And he looked at me and said, why don't put the sustainable battery here on the earth? And, and that kind of interface that you sort of, you allow something to be a little bit um, disruptive and maybe blue sky, 
and, and put them back into a realistic framework, that kind of friction we need to have between research and industry in Europe. And I think that is very productive. And I, I really appreciate all the kinds of tools that the Commission is putting up with the Battery Partnership, the Batteries Europe, where I'm also the chair of Working Group 1, Future Emerging Technologies, and all BATS, the skill program where I'm a godmother in, in the advisory board, because we need to put all these things together. And if I have the next slide, please, what do I think is important? Next slide, please. The, that is actually speed. We, it was said at the beginning of this uh, session that speed is a factor in the competition with China. And we said that the EBA would be fast, fast tracked. And we actually, as scientists, also need to build tools to accelerate the discovery of new sustainable materials that can lead to the sustainable batteries we can put here on Earth. And we have lots of tools in Europe. We have lots of experience, but we're also lacking some, we have some blind spots. We need to use the, the strong knowledge we have about material science, about um, we have a fantastic modeling community in Europe, and we have fantastic facilities. We have the Euro high performance computing now being built. We have synchrotrons and neutron facilities, and we have other infrastructures. Utilize them as much as we can to do this acceleration. And I think we've seen just yes, with this COVID how quickly, at least at my university, with 45,000 students, that we sent home more, more or less overnight and said, now you have to, to do your teaching on internet. And we adopted just in 48 hours and started to do it. That we can actually utilize the tools we are building up here. But I think one, it's also important to, to allow sort of long-term risky research where you have stars because the stars inspire new people and young people to come into the area and you need that to, to have uh, the people that can also actually give the education and the skills we need in the future as well as good people for industry and we need to work together it was very wisely said also at the beginning we we can't have too many parallel things we should concentrate and take the right decisions on what kind of research we need to do. So we should see research along the whole value chain, but also along the, the chain of short term, medium term and long term. And I think the long term vision can actually help by saying what kind of things do we need to do now in the nearest period to really reach to have this green battery on Earth. So I think that is sort of my take home message that uh, take the whole ecosystem into account. I can only tell you that when the European Battery Alliance was launched, I got ghost bumps uh, because something was happening that actually we facilitated and helped research also to do the right things and inspirational things to, to help also, I think, industry with different golden ideas and nudges. I think I stopped there because time is short and we are soon ending. <laughs> but thank you so much. Yeah, th th thank you very much, uh, both to James and, and, and Christina. Um, uh, we are close to the end, but we are allowed uh, to, to spend uh, kind of 10 minutes more. So uh, for all those who are still uh, uh, online, please stay online for a couple of questions because we do have questions. And uh, I, I suggest we go directly uh, to see what are the different questions from the audience and allow uh, 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 both of you and others uh, to, uh, to respond to, on, on this. Um, so uh, clearly, how will the UE, EU make sure that it doesn't lose leadership in batteries production to China? Uh, uh, this was uh, uh, more on the industrial side, but it's uh, in particular also true uh, on the technology and, and R&D side, because Chinese are not only manufacturing, they are also spending a lot of uh, effort into, into R&D. Uh, so how can we make sure we, well, gain technology leadership or at least play a, a significant role here? Christina. 
I would say we need to take it back from China. It's already there. <laughs> yes. and, uh, I can only speak for the research side. It's ex exactly true what you say, that if you look at the 10 uh, institutions producing most of the battery research in the world, nine are in China and one in US, and we don't need to be there, and we need to be there with the concentrated efforts and doing the right things and doing something a little bit different that they are not doing, not just copying, <laughs> but uh, being a little bit more innovative. And there we need to work together, research, industry and research together. Is it, is it a question of money and resources, essentially, or, or can we be smarter and faster? I think we could be smarter by, um, by not fragmentizing so many. If you look at right now, we have a, at least I am, uh, my research group is in five different uh, EU projects doing the, almost the same thing, graphite, silicon, uh, anodes. And uh, could we make a bit there to do a bit larger and, and uh, so on and make it meaningful or uh, have better overhearing between what's going on? So not reinventing revent, the wheel at this, in the same sort of kind of, of chemistries at the same time. Yeah, but uh, build better networks. I think, I think we need that. There we can do things better. James, and hopefully what? the ecosystem can yeah. give that. Hmm. Uh, yes. Mo, you, you want to comment? Yeah, yes, if I can, just uh, briefly on that. I, I would just come, like to uh, add on from uh, Christina's uh, uh, point about um, uh, focusing the, the research. And, uh, I, and I think we, the, the Commission is um, trying to, to do this by developing a strategic research agenda. And, and Christina is uh, involved in this project as well. So, yeah, the, we, what resources we do have, we use as, as effectively as possible, identify the priorities and target it through the batteries um, uh, par uh, partnership. Um, I just, I think it just uh, on this uh, competition. And certainly, what we we need to do in, in terms of on the industrial side is is first of all is to get the experience of mass battery uh, 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 manufacturing, uh, which we we don't have. I mean, it's a highly technical area, a, s a special set of skills. We need to get that experience, but we need, and this is where research is so crucial. Where the 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 leadership will come is when we in the next generation or refinements of this or on sustainability uh, uh, of uh, batteries, where we can then become um, competitive on a separate on a a, a new uh, a unique set of of selling points, and the regulatory requirements will be very important here as well to to support that process. Um, about the about the skills. Uh, uh, there was a question about the the skills. What what skills are lacking and and uh, is reskilling particularly appropriate in in certain sectors? Yeah. Well, as um, uh, sorry if I if I may take this point. I um, as I understand it, in fact, we're um, significantly short in a lot of. The areas um, uh, in the cell design. I think uh, if um, Emma was st uh, still online, she would be talking. She could contribute directly on the experience and difficulties Northfault have had in trying to recruit uh, people. Um, for all parts of their their operation, and I've had to recruit substantially, I think, from Japan, but other countries from outside uh, Europe. But I think the the important thing is it's not just the skills in the areas like the the cell design, certain types of chemistry, and so on. It's it's also on the mass production. This is the industrialization uh, of um, uh, battery production, which we we need as uh, uh, as well. Um, as we expand, even though our universities are producing um, uh, highly qualified engineers, this this sector is expanding so fast. Um, you know, there's going to be a huge, huge demand. So I I hesitate to say there's a particular area. I agree, okay. but I, I would like to add that uh, we can see there is also a lack of, of competence within the electric drive line when you make the system. And, and uh, we can see just by the, um, the COVID, the kind of 
courses we have given to Swedish automotive industry, that's a huge interest from their staff to learn more about this area, to be able to understand more. And to have people knowing about batteries and knowing about electrotechnology and that interface is also something that is lacking and where we need to grow more competence. Just so as an addition, I agree completely with James, otherwise. Uh, uh, a recurrent question is uh, where should we focus on? Is it on the high TRL levels or the lower TRL levels? There's one question, does funding exist to bridge the gap from TRL 2 to 6 to support startup developing sustainable technologies, not seducing uh, the EU industry yet because the TRL is st still low? What's, what's your stake on this? I think perhaps uh, Christina is better place than we are. I can start. Well, in my naive view, I think we have to work on all the TRL levels in parallel. And I think yeah, we can, of course, be much better. And I think there where you know energy can play a role and try and is playing a role is really to try to take this research that we're taking in the European Horizon 2020 projects and now and move them into SMEs and into the, the products. And that we can speed that up a lot more and do a lot more, of course. But we have good instruments that we should utilize even more. So we do yeah. have, but are they outside the industrial sphere? Is it something like uh, we'll work on low TRLs and and it's it's not connected to the industry because it's so low? I think we have, of course, low TRL level research which never reach the industry. And I think we need to have it also because it, without having that, we would never have the lithium ion battery. The Nobel Prize <laughs> was built yeah. on pure university curiosity driven research. <laughs> but uh, of course, as long as we, when we start to move up to more applied research, we really need to also uh, sort of mine the, the golden nudges from that that could go further into product. I, I guess Diego has more to tell about this. It's really your area. <laughs> well, I fully concur what you said, Christina and James, that is not mm. or is and, we both. But definitely uh, quite earlier than normally Europe has been acting, we should bring industry on board in, a, in non, not in a sequential pathways, but in absolutely working together pathways. That's maybe what has been missing because I've taken the purely TRL, so the NASA technology readiness level, instead of looking at the innovation, where you need about not only this, but also technology, but also manufacturing and supply chain. And this, I think that has changed a lot with EBA. EBA has been taken as a reference for the future to be industrial strategic value chains of uh, the next commi this commission. That's good news. I think that we are learning of what we tried and what we could be improved. Yeah, and I just very quickly add to that, that in the, the battery partnership, which is being discussed at the moment, and this is where the European Commission will focus its uh, money for battery research, industry are playing a, a role there in trying to identify the, the suitable topics. So absolutely, it has to be a, a, a mix. It's getting the balance right. But I must say that I'm very impressed by the Asian industry, because if you have a publication on something interesting, they are in your lab asking about samples and wanting to know more within two weeks. While in Europe, it's like, oh, no one else has done this. It can't be interesting. So here we have an attitude also as a company, I think. Mm -hmm. so, so maybe as a, as a last question and to, to conclude both this third block, but I think it is valid for the, for the entire uh, conference. Do we need, do we plan to have a batteries label made in Europe? or more specifically, how to make sure that these innovations reinforce the European industry in, in particular. Uh, uh, maybe each of you can, can comment on this as a, as, as a last, uh, uh, as your last word, and, and, and maybe you have other comments uh, to the entire session, but uh, how do we make sure uh, we have batteries in Europe? Um, well, I think I'll go. I will go first. I think the the important uh, thing will. I, I think this is where the the legislation will play a critical role, where we will identify what we want in terms of performance and criteria for batteries placed on the market in Europe, 
and and this, I, I mean, I don't know about a, 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 an EU label there, but it, it this will help shape what we want. The I think we we already have significant battery production in Europe because uh, because batteries uh, are expensive and, and dangerous to transport, you will have battery production there. The key thing, I think, for Europe, and I speak as an industrial uh, uh, policy perspective, ensure that there is a European uh, element to this production, that we're developing batteries that we need, we think are, are, uh, are important for the future, according to criteria we, we set. Um, and I think that's, that's the, the, the key issue. But from my side, uh, from my side, I'm the fact guy, the facts guy. So four years ago, there were zero gigawatt hours of batteries uh, produced in Europe, basically. If I, now there is commitments for 240 gigawatt hours. Number one, number two. Last year, 2019 has been in the world. Europe has been the economy where the biggest number of investments in batteries across all the value chain has landed, and that we have done that as Europeans in, four, in three, four years. So uh, let's keep on doing. Speed. Mattia, the last word from your side. Yes, um, I, I think indeed that there will be some labeling obligations in the new battery regulation. What will be done in the new battery regulation will be a digital passport for batteries. So what we are thinking is to, uh, to provide both static and dynamic information about the batteries. Some of this information will be relevant for the car manufacturers and other of them will be relevant for the uh, final consumer. But indeed that's, uh, and to be honest, we're not thinking about uh, labeling of uh, made in, in the EU, but rather to differentiate batteries uh, rather on the performance, on the quality, on the um, on the due diligence obligations. So there will be clearly elements, and then of course uh, both the car manufacturer and the consumer, by looking at this uh, labeling information and this battery pa passport, uh, will be able to uh, determine which are. Uh, the, the most uh, sustainable one, or what they call uh, sometimes the green batteries, but uh, indeed uh, um, we do not consider for such a type of industrial product uh, the, the type of uh, made in EU approach is the, is the most uh, relevant one. But there will be indeed uh, lots of uh, labeling uh, and, uh, as I said, uh, um, obligation in terms of information requirements. Thank you. And uh, as it is uh, with me at, at home, uh, women always have the last word. Uh, so I think we have, uh, Emma has, has, has left uh, and Heitze as well. Uh, but I, I, I leave it up to you, uh, Christina, to give us your, your last comments for, this, uh, for today's uh, conference. Well, if, if I'm sort of to sum up the whole conference, I think it has been an extremely interesting um, portfolio of different visions for this uh, battery echo field. But uh, if we go back to the question of labeling, I, I as a scientist and uh, looking at this, I really hope the legislation the, will support sustainability and the, the production of batteries, but it should not hamper the, the development of other applications. So it becomes too expensive for the automotive companies to buy these batteries. So I hope you think about this delicate balance when you uh, do your, your legislation. And I think also this meeting today has shown the, the breadth we need to really have all these uh, things in place and that it's, it's happening now and it's moving on quickly and speed is really important for all parts of this battery ecosystem. I think Batteries Europe is a beautiful way of, of actually having this researchers and industry and the friction I need to, to really so sharpen my thoughts at least in this area. So thank you so much. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Christina. Thanks uh, to all the speakers. Well, time is, is over. The very last word will be to our uh, audience. Um, and I'll ask the, uh, the technical staff to put on the, the last poll while I try to conclude on, uh, on this, uh, this conference. I think, uh, yes, indeed, it was uh, uh, very interesting. Uh, time is always too short. Uh, but I think, I hope that for those who were listening to us uh, and even until the end, I think are, we are still 
still yeah more than 250 participants uh, i think we have felt that there is now a strong connection between on the one hand the public authorities the different uh, instances at european level and on the other hand industry and research uh, and there is also an awareness about the fact that we need to cover the entire value chain and I think there is a good understanding of what this means. The figure I keep on the, on this uh, conference is the 210 billion new GDP, uh, and uh, this this is the figure. But the the, the important thing is that it is announced uh, by industry and endorsed and taken up by uh, the authorities, uh, who well. I, I am confident we'll do the best to really implement the actions that are necessary to trigger this. Well, with this, uh, we see that diversity, informative, clear vision. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, I take this as a compliment for, I think, for all the speakers uh, in this one and a half uh, hour. Um, more, more specifically, if you still have uh, questions or, or, or feedback, uh, on what uh, you think about this uh, seminar. I think the, uh, the interactive section still uh, stays open for a moment. With this, um, I think we're done. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you for the organizers. Um, this uh, is, is replacing in a relatively effective way a, a conference we would have had otherwise in, in, in Brussels and hopefully next year again as a European Sustainable Energy Week in, uh, in person in, in, in Brussels. Uh, I personally really would like to continue the discussion and, and talk to you around the cappuccino, which we virtually shared uh, at the beginning of the session. Thanks to all of you. Uh, well, see you next time in, in Brussels, hopefully, and bye-bye uh, and for today. Thank you. Bye-bye.